All right, we're going to get started. Uh, we're going to do class a little bit different. Not sure if it's uh, our guest speaker or the whole New Year's resolution or brought the attendance. But I might just have him back next week, so we'll see. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, not do any announcements or uh, praises and prayer requests. We'll pick all that up next week, and we'll get back on the, the church's topic next week and then you'll your growth group leaders will continue to reach out to you as we create our family principles and kind of what we're going to be focusing on in first quarter so this is kind of a, a wrap up i'll kind of give you an introduction as to why we're doing this class for the last three months we focused on 20 different religions we've learned about them uh, we've seen different interviews and different studies and talks some of you I've been growing up childhood best friends with these different religions. And one of them that we never did really discuss was agnostic, atheism, uh, free thinkers. And so throughout uh, December, you might have seen some different news clips and things like that. Uh, a bus ad that the atheists had put together that said, millions of Americans are good without God. A couple weeks later when it launched, uh, there was another uh, truck that was launched that said, uh, I still love you, sign God. And so we're going to talk about that today. Uh, through a couple different interviews, uh, Zach and I connected. We ended up having lunch a week or two ago for a couple hours. He's a great guy. Kind of the point of me inviting him into this room is really to kind of clear up uh, what free thinkers or what atheists believe because we all have a stigma of kind of what that looks like or what we think they are. Uh, a lot of us are, are scared or fearful or, or even maybe even angry. If you saw some of the news reports, a lot of different preachers, a lot of different people that were interviewed on the streets were angry about it. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so the structure of today, I'm going to attempt to show you a video. Uh, hopefully it'll rasterize its way through um, and then we're going to uh, do like a um, interview style thing where I'm going to go through about 10 questions we're going to go through those as quickly as possible but they'll give you a good background of kind of what that belief is and, and where they're coming from and why they form this coalition um, you know when I had met Zach about five guys decided that morning to meet and, and uh, pray over that meeting and even begin to pray for Zach and over the last seven days actually it's been two weeks now they've continued to pray for him so I'll tell you this there's nothing profound that you're going to say to him that he hasn't already heard he's grown up a Christian um, he got into this new wave when he was in grad school and taking different classes and <coughs> philosophies and things like that so he'll share some of that uh, the Bible's real, real clear. The Holy Spirit's the one that uh, draws somebody to salvation and, and to Christ. So be open. Uh, feel free to fire away. I told him nobody's going to throw stones at him. So if you did bring any of those, just put them back in your pocket. You can save those for me next week. So I'm going to play this video, and then we'll uh, have him come up. An ad campaign some consider controversial will soon be on Fort Worth city buses. Take a look. The ads will read, Millions of Americans Good Without God. Now, the bottom line message, God does not exist. One of the folks behind the campaign, Terry McDonald. Terry, you're with the Dallas-Fort Worth Coalition of Reason. Thanks for being with us. i got to start it off and let you know I don't like the campaign at all, and I posted it on my, my Facebook, and it got a lot of people upset. Is that what you're trying to do is make people mad? Because if it is, it's, it's working. No, we're not trying to make any mad anybody mad. We're uh, we're really trying to appeal to people uh, who are like us, who uh, who don't believe in God, who are uh, secular people, and, uh, and to let them know that there's a lot of us out here, out there, and we there's places that they can go, groups that they can join to uh, to be with people who have a lot of the same worldview as they do. So you get a lot of followers using campaigns like this. Yes, we do. I've had I've had some today. I've had emails today from people saying I. I'm so glad uh, that you did this uh, um, because we've been looking for groups like this. We didn't know they, they existed. All right, now we did ask some folks what they thought, and, and we heard from both sides. Let's, let's listen. There's people that uh, protest because there's 
religious things put up at the courthouses, you know, and they don't want that. And so I would be, just as some people are offended by that, that would be offensive to me. I understand everybody has freedom of speech, but that's public transportation, and I just think that's not the place to do that. The what, the First Amendment right? If they want to say that, they have the right to say that. You know, I hate to say it, but that, that's what also makes this country great. Hey, Terry, why did you pick right now the Christmas season to roll out the campaign? We didn't really select the, uh, the Christmas season. Uh, really? Because this is when everybody's talking about crime. I mean, I have to think there's something behind right now. Well, well, uh, as you say, this, this, the campaign is upsetting you. Which month would you prefer that we use except for December? Well, it's not that I would prefer a month, but, but truly, right now, when everybody's talking about Christ and the re Jesus, the reason of the season, the, uh, that sort of thing, it, it would seem like you, you think that this is top of mind for folks, so hey, let's do this right now. Well, we, di we didn't target December. Uh, we've okay. been working on this for quite some time. The thing just came to, to be uh, right now. Uh, we knew we'd have some problems because some people don't, don't like it uh, sure. in December, and um, we considered not doing it, and we thought, well, we're ready to do it, and... Uh, you know, nobody owns December, and so. Well, sure. And and on the other hand, there there are a lot of people, as I say, that we're appealing to that uh, are exposed to so many religious messages uh, during this time of right. the year, uh, and then to let them know that they're they're not alone. Some place uh, for them to go. Now, you did try to get the ads on Dart buses in the Dallas area. Dart said no. They they have a policy that does not allow religious ads. But we do have a statement from the folks at the T. I, I want to read the statement to you. It reads: The T strives to be fair to all parties in accepting advertising for its bus system and to not discriminate against faiths or beliefs. So Terry, are you going to go after DART? you Are going to try to let DART put your messages on, on Dallas buses? Uh, no, not really. Uh, they changed their, uh, their uh, uh, policy last year to eliminate all religious ads and so we really consider this a, a, a victory for secularism not to have those religious ads on the bus and we're perfectly not happy not to have them on there. So did you try then to get your ads on the buses prior to them changing that? Yes. You did? And, and the plan was to possibly do it, and then you just didn't, and you went for Fort Worth? Or how did that play out? Uh, well, that's, it's been a while since we've yeah. done this. We started it uh, actually in 08, and when okay. we went to them in, in uh, uh, 2008, uh, they, they said, well, yeah, they would take the ads. And then, okay. uh, and then when, by the time we kind of put the thing together, they said, no, we've changed they our changed policy. It. Hey, just curious, Terry, if somebody says Merry Christmas, what's your response? <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> All right. Well, then, Happy New Year and Merry Christmas from me to you, Terry. <laughs> well, a Happy New Year to you. Thanks, Terry McDonald. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Group ...that started following buses with ads by an atheist group that were reading millions of people are good without God. The Christian's truck shows a message from God saying, I still love you. Now the transit agency is banning all religious ads from buses. Is religion being unfairly censored? Joining us now is the owner of the now banned Christian ad truck and president of Lime Media, Mr. Heath Hill. Thanks for being with us, Heath. Absolutely. Are you offended by the city stepping in and making and saying that they're all banned completely across the board? You know, I think it's unfortunate uh, just because it doesn't allow people to express uh, their views. The, the atheist ad was never offensive uh, to us. It was an opportunity for Christians to to really communicate our message, and that's one of love. So you saw it as an opportunity. Well, the city is banning all religious ads, all political ads now because of this. Are they violating free speech when they make this decision? You know, that's a good question. Uh, obviously, the, the simple answer is yes. Um, for us as Christians, it's unfortunate because now we can't get our message out as well. How did people react to you following the atheist bus with a Christian message? You know, it was unbelievably uh, positive. We had a lot of uh, calls and emails of just encouragement and support. So overall, the campaign was uh, extremely successful. Why did you decide to do it? You know, it just seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, there was uh, a group of people that, that felt that the, that it was an opportunity, one that uh, wouldn't be there forever, but the, the message was clear is that, you know, even in denying God and, and rejecting God, that he still has love, and, and that's a message that we wanted to get out. Well, how are folks there reacting? Are they boycotting public transportation now in Fort Worth? 
You know, there's a lot of different churches that have taken uh, different stands, and we've heard that some of the churches have asked members to, to boycott uh, transportation. Uh, for us, it wasn't that angle. Uh, it was just one of just really, you know, sharing that love and kind of communicating that through the, the medium that we chose. Uh, it could have been done any, any different ways, but uh, there's definitely been some mixed reactions in Fort Worth. Well, the APS buses, are they still going to be on the streets? Is this, does, do they have to end it now or follow through with the contract? They'll continue to run these buses? How does that work? Yeah, we've been told that they've basically the council has, has made the decision not to allow any uh, political or religious ads, but they've got to honor the contract uh, as it is sold in. All right, so does that mean you get to follow the buses until their contract's up too? You know, we've pulled uh, our ad this week. We feel our mission's really been accomplished. Uh, our message has been heard. Um, we can legally drive our truck anywhere we want because we're a private organization, so mm -hmm. there's no tie-in uh, to the city on that. Well, um, but we, we have pulled our bus. Have any atheists that were supporting those are the atheist bus message, have they come to you now and asked you questions about God? They have, actually. I've got a, a lunch set up for the first of the year with one of the leaders of the organization. Really? That is interesting. Okay, so great. It, it, it will be interesting. We'll see. All right. Well, good deal. We wish you the best. And I guess I can Absolutely. say this to you. Merry Christmas. Yeah, and I just want to say happy birthday to Jesus. So Thank you. Y'all have a good one. Thank you. you All right. So I'm going to uh, introduce Zachary Moore to come up front, and we'll get this, this thing started. Y'all give him a welcome. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm not typical of, of atheists and non-believers in that. I actually do really enjoy coming to visit churches. Normally, I'm just sitting in the back of the pew, you know, just enjoying the experience. And, and I go, and I, 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 it's not just Christian churches I like experiencing either. You know, since I've stepped away from Christianity, um, I've got a, sort of a new appreciation for all the different religious traditions that are out there. And I know he said that you've been learning about a lot of them. So I've been to Hindu temples, Buddhist temples, synagogues, mosques, all sorts of different flavors of, of Christian uh, houses of worship. And it's always a really interesting experience for me uh, because I'm the outsider at every single one of them. And, uh, and I get to see how the different traditions have played out, how different people... <laughs> God wanted to silence you, my <laughs> But it's interesting to see how the different uh, you know, denominations have interpreted the scriptures in different ways. I still love you. Now the transit agency is... We'll come back to that. Go ahead. But it's interesting to see how the different you know, denominations interpret the, the verses in their scriptures in different ways and, and how they apply those and, and what their, their different cultural sort of milieus look like. So it's, it's, it's always fun to, to meet out and uh, you know, reach some Christians and other believers and, and uh, you know, get their perspective. So it's my pleasure to be here. So here's what's the most interesting thing about what came out of our lunch was that he said a majority of people in his group have grown up Christian. Okay, so I kind of had the view that, you know, an atheist or somebody like that was just dark and, you know, I don't know, somebody to, you know, I just didn't want to play with them and I didn't want to have anything to do with them. And, you know, that was just kind of my view. And as... I got into it and studied it more. I was like, oh, they're just very intellectual. They can't make it make sense. And so those are some of the things that I want you to try to listen to as he talks. And so kind of tell us the difference between an atheist and agnostic and uh, this new term that a lot of people are hearing and using, free, free thinker. Thoughts, yeah. So these are, these are all different terms, um, and they all mean slightly different things. And, and some some people look at them as say, well, I'm either an atheist or an agnostic or a free thinker or a humanist. I sort of look at the the the, um, the definitions of all these, and I, I see that they apply to me all of them really. So the word atheist just means without God, without without a God belief. So anybody who lacks belief in a God for whatever reason um, is an atheist. We are all in this room atheists to a number of gods that have been postulated to exist, you know, throughout the centuries. Vishnu, um, uh, Ganesh, 
um, all sorts of different deities that are out there that other people do believe in, you know, currently today, but we are atheistic to those, those gods. So in the, it, it sort of depends in you know, what context I'm talking about. So if it's in the Christian context, the god that Christians believe in, I don't believe in that one. So in that regards, I'm an atheist to that. Um, for most of the other guys out there, you know, Christians are atheistic to those. So we're all, we're all atheists. I just, I'm atheist to one other god. In terms of agnostic, agnostic is a uh, reference to, you know, what you can know. So it comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And uh, the word agnostic was coined by Thomas Huxley in the 19th century um, as a way of saying, well, look, what, on the question of God, we can't really know whether, I mean, we can't come to a, a, a position of belief, a yes, I believe, or no, I don't believe, because there's just not enough knowledge. So he was saying, well, there's just not enough knowledge. And I, I agree with him to a certain extent. I think there, the amount of knowledge that we can have available to us about um, all sorts of different deities, especially you know the, the traditional Christian theistic God, um, it's, it's really nebulous, and I, I don't think it's been fleshed out really well. So I, I do consider myself agnostic in that respect. The word free thinker um, has has been a little bit more popularized recently, primarily because it's not associated with the atheist word, and the atheist word has kind of become like a bad word now in society. So calling somebody an atheist is like insulting them, pretty much. Um, you know, atheist was, was in the 50s, it was tied with the, the Communist Party, and still is sort of, oh, if you're, you're a godless heathen. You know, if you, even if you look in the dictionary, you look at the word godless, one of the definitions is a bad person. Right? And the reason, you know, that's part of the reason why we did the, the Good Without God campaign is to sort of counteract that, that you know, feeling out there in, in the popular culture that to be without a God is to be a bad person. Um, but so free thinker means to, to arrive at your conclusions without appealing to tradition, without appealing to authority. So whatever your beliefs are, um, it, it's a, a free thinker does not say, well, this is what has always been done. This is what has been believed for hundreds or thousands of years. Or this, was, this is what my parents believed, and this is what their parents believed, and their parents, so I'm going to believe it too. A freethinker wouldn't do that. A freethinker also would not appeal to authority. A freethinker would not say, well, look, you know, my priest told me that this is true, so I'm going to believe it. My pastor told me that this is true, so I'm going to believe it. My father, you know, was, you know your father is a position of authority, told me that this is true, so I'm going to believe it. You can even take that and, and expand that. If God said it, then it must be true. And God is in the ultimate position of authority. So a free thinker says, no, wait a minute. I'm not going to take anybody's word for it. I'm going to uh, you know, apply reason, critical thought, um, the scientific method. I really want to know, I want to be able to demonstrate for myself that these things are true. So to be a free thinker is to apply that, that mindset of you know, critical thinking and um, appreciation for rigorous scientific investigation, and only those things that you can comfortably prove and demonstrate to other people that are true are those things that you, you, know, you form your beliefs around. And finally, the last uh, term, which is, is sometimes applied as humanist, uh, frequently uh, it's a, it's a two-word term, secular humanist, also kind of has a negative con connotation, at least on Fox News. Um, <laughs> but to be, to be a humanist is to form your, your philosophy um, around... Uh, the human being, so that the human being is the ultimate good, you know, and anything that we do in our, in our lives, if we try to benefit um, humanity. So, so centering your, your personal philosophy around, you know, benefiting and, and raising up humanity is, is basically to be a humanist. And there are theistic humanists out there also, um, but there are also quite a lot of, of secular humanists who form that philosophy and say, we don't really need God to inform that philosophy. So in that sense, it's to, to be a humanist. And so for all of those four concepts, I sort of I take you know, aspects of those you know, to myself because of all the God concepts that I've heard of, I don't believe in any of them. So in that sense, I'm an atheist. Um, I have real problems with the idea of there being sufficient knowledge um, to really make a conclusion for any of these God concepts. So in that concept, you know, in that respect, I'm an agnostic. Um, I also try to apply um, critical thinking and rigorous you know, reason and rationality to all my beliefs. So in that sense, I'm a free thinker. And I, I try to, you know, from my own personal philosophy, I, I try to make it very human-centered. Um, and so in that respect, I'm a humanist. So I hope that clears things up a little bit. So one of the things that came out of our, our lunch that really was shocking to me or kind of blew my mind was that a lot of atheists or even agnostic 
would not say, I'm 100% sure there's not a God, or I'm 100% sure of this belief. There's always that, well, you know, we can't know for absolute certain. And I was, for me, that was shocking because if I'm going to publicly make that claim, I sure as heck better know without a question of a doubt that I believe that. But it counteracts their whole concept of kind of what that belief is. So give us a stereotype of the what you would say the average person is in your coalition on a Saturday activity. Like, what is that family and that mom and that dad? What do they look like? What do they do for a job? What, you know, kind of give us a... a what you would say, and I know it's hard, but like a stereotype of what that family makeup looks like. Well, I mean, quite frankly, they look like you people. I mean, they're, they're, they're your neighbors, they're your friends, they're the people that you work with. Um, they're, you know, policemen, uh, firemen, doctors, lawyers, teachers. We actually have, there are a lot of teachers that are free thinkers out there and, um, in public school and in private school. Um, so you, there's nowhere you can get away from. <laughs> and, 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 um, and, uh, you know, the type of things that they like to do is, you know, for the most part, it's the same type of thing that, that everyone likes to do. I mean, they're not, they don't really that different. Um, you know, when we have, uh, my organization is called the uh, Fellowship of Free Thought. And uh, we have a lot of families. We have a very diverse, you know, group of, of people. And we do a lot of different activities. Some of them we just do for fun. Some of, you know, we've got a hockey game that we're going to next week just to go to a hockey game together. Um, the uh, a bunch of parents got together, uh, I think, two weeks ago and went ice skating, just to go ice skating together. Um, so we, we like having fun. Uh, last night, we were actually just on the other side of the lake at um, the Flying Saucer next to the Bass Pro. And all we did is just go in there. We got the back room and you know, had some beers and chatted and had a grand old time. So He's them, big into homebrew, so I was going to try to hook him up with Kevin and Evan after this. <laughs> see if they could, I so, know, yeah, I mean, for, for the most part, we just like having fun. But there, there are other things that we like to do. So, um, you know, last, uh, last af yesterday afternoon, actually, and this sort of plays into the stereotype. Last Yesterday afternoon, we had a philosophy club. And this is sort of the stereotype that, you know, well, atheists and non-believers, they're all so intellectual and, you know, all they care about philosophy and, you know, answering all these unanswerable questions and delving. And, you know, we kind of do. I mean, there are, there was a, there are a lot of people that, that showed up. There were about 40, 40 people that showed up, which is, you know, a good-sized crowd to, to delve into philosophy. And um, it's, it's one of those things that a lot of us have been interested in sort of peripherally. I've, I'm not a philosopher by any means, but it's, it's something that I thought was interesting. Um, but, you know, that was one thing that we did. So, you know, instead of getting together for a Bible study, you know, which, which you know, Christians will do, and, you know, other, other believers will have their, you know, they'll study their scriptures. Um, you know, we got together, I mean, we read some articles about, you know, Rene Descartes, you know, who was trying to explore the nature of reality and, and how he could be sure that what he was seeing was actually there, was actually, you know, part of reality. Um, and, you know, that was something that was fun for us. So that, I mean, that kind of does play into that stereotype. And, and we like to go out and, and you know, find um, events that, that do, you know, tickle our intellect a little bit. We like to, you know, go to museums, go to science museums, and, you know, maybe go to lectures sometimes, and, you know, go to debates. And, and so there is that, there is that intellectual aspect of it. But it, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't define us. It's not all that we do. We, we like to have fun. So in our lunch, he made the comment that, you know, overall, the group and the people in the group have a very high standard of morality and are, are overall good people. And something that I struggled with is where does that come from? You know, if you're if you're if there's good and bad, where does that come from? And why be so moral? And where you know, I invited him to go to Cornerstone. And I thought I had him, and then he said, "Well, we don't believe in evangelizes and do, and doing goodness." And so I said, "Maybe we can do something." you know, just good together, the both groups. And I said, the only problem with that is there's nothing we do where we don't evangelize. I can't think of one, even one kind of example. If I'm going to give you a coat, you're going to hear about my God, just the way it works. And I don't, I don't even know how to separate uh, the two. But when we were talking, what, what would you say, or you would want people to know, as to what is the moral compass? You made the comment in the email that we do good for goodness sake, and I thought of the mm -hmm. Christmas carol, mm -hmm. but other than that, I've never, I've never thought of that statement. Yeah. You know what I mean? Other than, than that. So what's the moral compass, and what guides and directs 
you and kind of that group of people to, to be moral and productive. Right. Well, it, it's, a, it's a totally different way of thinking about it, about morality. And it was, it was something that I struggled with, actually, when I, you know, when I gave up Christianity. For me, it was, um, it was, it was primarily an intellectual thing. You know, I, I was studying into the Bible you know, really deeply. And, and, the, and the things that I studied and the things I found out you know, um, sort of cor- corrupted my faith and, and you know, made me have to give it up. Um, but as, as I was giving that up, you know, I was still sort of operating in, as the same basic person. You know, I did, my behaviors didn't change. Um, you know, I didn't go out and kill people and start stealing and things like that. And you know, I found that you know, my, my basic moral instincts were still about the same. And it, it kind of was a struggle for me because um, within the Christian paradigm, it, it is f- a fairly clear um, way of going about morality. It's, it's, philosophers call it divine command theory. And not all Christians you know, think about it this way, but basically it's, it's the idea of, well, you know, God is, a, is an ultimate good you know, thing, and he tells you what is good, and you do it, you know pretty simple. And so that when you talk about the moral compass, you know, it's, you're, you're thinking of something external that's, that's directing you, that's giving you instructions, and you, know, you do this, and this is good, and, and if, if you don't do this, and that's bad. So obviously, without a God in your life, without a belief in God, that sort of external guidepost doesn't, doesn't exist. So how is it that, that you, know, you can think about morality? And uh, the answer to that is, well, there's a lot of different ways. And, you know, when you talk to atheists, um, you'll find that, you know, a lot of them have different, you know, ways of coming up with their own moral sensibilities um, and, their, and explaining their own moral instincts. I've been exploring personally um, a, a type of moral theory called desirism that, that seeks to explain and inform uh, the way we operate morally by tapping into, you know, what our um, fundamental desires are as people and, and, you know, how they interact with others. And for me, that's the that's sort of the, the ultimate uh, human-centered morality, or that that central aspect of that is realizing that, you know, when I operate in society, I'm not operating as just myself. You know, the things that I do aren't don't have they they do have repercussions with everybody else that I interact with, and I also have to realize that the actions that everybody else has are act- are things that would have repercussions on me, and so that sets up. Now we have sort of a different moral dynamic. Now I have to worry about, well, the things that I'm doing and the things that I'm valuing here in society are affecting my fellow humans, and the things that they're doing are affecting me as well. So it becomes less of a, you know, what is this person up there telling us all to do, and a little bit more of, well, let's figure out as a group how we're behaving and how we're interacting, and can we make sense of that, and, and can we figure out some, some way of, you know, everybody sort of getting you know, what they want without trouncing over the, the rights and the values of other people. It kind of goes back to, um, a bunch of people in here have kids, I assume. This is a, yeah. When you have, you know, little kids and, you know, little Billy, you know, takes the toy from Polly. And, you know, you can't really explain at that point, you know, you don't do that because, you know, God says that's a bad thing to do because, you know, the kid's like two or, two or three years old and doesn't really understand. You say, how would you like it if Polly took something of yours? You wouldn't like that very much, would you? You know, and that's something that they can understand, and that's sort of ap- applicable to us all. You know, if I were to take something of Heath's, you know, how would I like it if he took you know something from me? If we had a society that worked that way, everything would be utter chaos. So I can I can you know sort of expand from that example and see you know a society in which you know stealing is permissible is not a very good society. It's not one that's going to last very long, and it's not going to be one that I'm going to want to live in. So. It doesn't really answer the question, but it gives you a, a hint into the thought processes that go into, you know, how people that, that, that if, you, if you don't work God into the equation, how we can sort of think about morality and, and how to be good people. How would you define or say, growing up in the church, and he had parents that went to church, he told me, you know, he wasn't beaten and abused and yelled at and all those kind of things. He had a very normal childhood and... and you know, normal parents and that kind of thing. And growing up in church, you've heard the word sin and you know what that context is. And mm-hmm. believers and non-believers all deal with sin. I mean, it's it's inevitable. What is y'all's perspective or take on, on sin and ultimately what sin, we have a saying that it, it 
takes you somewhere you don't want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, and costs you more than you want to spend. And ultimately, it, it ends up in complete bondage. Mm -hmm. Sin, in essence, is just that separation from God. <laughs> How would you define that? What, what word would you use? Do you, do you acknowledge and use that word sin? Mm -hmm. uh, because obviously... You wouldn't use it in the context we would. Right. But how would you define that if you're trying to talk to your 12-year-old? Well, you know, in that, in our context, you know, sin is a a, a violation against God, right? It's, it's it's a it's a transgression against God. It's a like you said, separation from God. And and without God, in our worldview, it, it that as a, as a term that has no meaning. So so sin is not part of it at all. Um, you know, we can talk about you know, good behavior or bad behavior, uh, in that in that same context I was talking about before about you know explaining morality to kids as um, you know dealing with their fellow fellow humans and understanding um, you know ethical reciprocity. You know the fact that if you do something bad to somebody else, they can do something bad back to you, and you wouldn't like that very much either. And so that you know the the, the concept of sin just doesn't exist for us and so we so have to what if it's something like pornography or what if it's alcoholism what if it's a what we would call a sin that basically might not have a direct effect to Nate Merrill if I'm doing it you know and I'm into pornography and I'm up at the middle of the night you know doing this and that and I've been married three years and have a one-year-old kid uh, I might not directly affect him but clearly I'm in bondage to that sin. I'm getting up at 3 in the morning, staying up till 6, right. and spending money that I shouldn't be. How would you make sense of that? And is that something that uh, you all ever talk about or address? Because obviously in Bible studies, that's a mm -hmm. top you know, topic that we deal with, whether it's gossip or cheat, you know, whatever it is, we're always trying to address those. It's a, it's, a, in my opinion, it's a, it's a subject for cognitive behavioral therapy. I think there's, um, you know, within the realm of psychology, there's a lot of really good research into, you know, the way our minds work and the sort of patterns we fall into. And, you know, addictions are, are part of that. And, you know, depending on, you know, the different levels, I mean, we all have, you know, slight addictions to different things, you know, whether it be coffee or, you know, reruns of Seinfeld or, you know, whatever. Um, but understanding the way the mind works, um, I think, is, is the key to, you know, figuring out, you know, how, how those patterns form and, and how we can, you know, break those if they're, if they're, if they're um, you know, causing negative effects in people's lives. Um, but that's, that's a, um, I mean, that's not something that I would um, attempt um, just as a, as a lay person, I wouldn't, um, you know, it's, again, it's a different paradigm because, you know, you've got, you know, Bible verses and things that you can um, utilize and, and, you know, reach out to somebody and, and send them towards, you know, maybe religious counseling, whereas I would just, you know, I would urge somebody who is, if I was, you know, aware of somebody who was um, in some sort of an addictive, you know, pattern, uh, I would just urge them to, you know, to get psychological treatment, um, particularly from somebody who specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy. Gotcha. So I got some clarity to this question, but kind of explain, if you don't believe in God and you don't believe in this, why put time, money, resources, and effort into a campaign or a promotion that says that? Because obviously before we talk, right. that seemed like the most obvious question of all, <laughs> to say why, who in the world is going to spend money on nothing? Basically, right? Yeah. So how would you explain that? Well, so you got to have a little bit of, of the backstory to um, the DFW Coalition of Reason. So there have been, for several decades, actually, different secular groups that have been in existence in Dallas and in Fort Worth, um, and you know, even sort of scattered around. There's one in Terrell. Uh, there's one all the way over in Tyler, believe it or not. Um, and for the longest time, these different groups just sort of, you know, existed as tiny little clusters, you know, of people meeting in, you know, the, the back rooms of a coffee shop, you know, and, and they, they would just have these little tiny discussions, and they wouldn't do really anything else, and they didn't really get to know anybody else. Um, and so about two years ago, there is an organization called the United Coalition of Reason that was originally based out of uh, Philadelphia, um, that they decided that what they really wanted to do, they wanted to try to make a, a mark and make some you know, positive changes in the sort of secular landscape, as it were, you know, as 
atheists and free thinkers have been you know, more in the news and you know, more, more attention paid on them. Um, but they really want to go to these different metropolitan areas and find places where there's all these scattered little tiny groups of atheists all over the place and give them a way to come together. And so um, they came to Dallas-Fort Worth. It was actually the first place where they, they sort of planted this, this organization uh, two years ago. And all they do is promotional stuff. I mean, that's, that's their whole purpose. That's their, their entire mission is to promote the existence of these organizations in the different you know, metroplexes where they, where they target. And so they came to DFW. There was a number of organizations. There were some metroplex atheists, um, who's, which is uh, run by Terry McDonald, and you saw him in the video. And he's the current um, coordinator for the Coalition of Reason. I'll actually be taking over for him um, in April. And there was also the Church of Free Thought. There was the uh, Free Thinkers in Fort Worth. Uh, my group, the Free Thinkers of Dallas. Um, there's a number of other, there's the North Texas Skeptics, but a whole bunch of other, you know, different groups, and they're all brought together under the same banner for the purpose of shared promotion. And all the Coalition of Reason really does, up to this point, is that promotion. So the first thing we did was a billboard campaign in uh, 2009. It was uh, a blue sky with clouds, and it said, if, if you don't believe in God, you're not alone. And that's, that's all it was, and we did that in... Uh, it actually coincided with Easter, but nobody really caused a big stink at that time. <laughs> so speaking of Easter, what do you do? What do you do when Easter's here and Christmas is here? What would you do over Christmas? So, How does that look? I mean, it's it's interesting because I mean, even even Christians, you know, today sort of admit that Christmas has become a totally secular holiday. I mean, there's really not much of of, of the holiday as as celebrated in the public sphere that really is religious. Everything has been replaced by you know, Jingle Bells and Santa Claus and Frosty the Snowman. And, and all that stuff is secular. And it really, I mean, it has a, um, a, a religious history. Um, but, you know, that doesn't really matter, you know. Um, you know, today is Sunday. You know, we call it Sunday. Tomorrow is Monday. Moon Day. You know, it's, it's recognizing an ancient, you know, worship of the sun and the moon. Tuesday is Thor's Day. Wednesday is Woden's Day. These are other gods from the Norse traditions, and we, we use their names in, in the days of the week. That doesn't mean we worship them. That doesn't mean we care that it comes from some, you know, bizarre religious context. And so for, for atheists and unbelievers, Christmas is kind of like that. Most of the traditions that have come up um, and the traditions that have really gotten popular are those that, that resonate, you know, for everybody. And, and the, the, the biggest, you know, nowadays when you see in, you know, secular media... You know, whenever a character was is grappling with what's the real meaning of Christmas, I mean, it's always just is distilled down to spending time with your family, which everyone, everyone can sort of get on with that. Everyone loves that. That you know resonates with everyone. Um, and so the you know, religious aspects are downplayed. For Easter, there really hasn't been a commensurate secular popularization of Easter. There just really has. I mean, there's I guess there's the Easter bunny um, and all the candy and stuff, but it doesn't really the Easter um, and I guess it's because also because of the commercialization of it, because now, you know, like the anchor w was saying, well, it's December, it's the Christmas season. Well, it's only the Christmas season in all of December because it's been stretched all the way back to Thanksgiving because they want people to start shopping <laughs> as soon as Thanksgiving is over, right? If, 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 you, if, you go, if you talk to the Catholics, they recognize that the actual Christmas season doesn't start until the 25th. The 25th. Because the, the Christmas season goes from uh, Christmas, um, Christmas Eve, actually, at midnight, all the way to Epiphany on January 6th. That's the, that's the actual Christmas season. That's the religious Christmas season, the, the 12 days of Christmas, so to speak. And so, you know, talking about December as being, you know, well, this is the sacred month for the Christians. Kind of like, you know, well, like Ramadan is the sacred month for the, for the Muslims. It's really not like that. Um, but, you know, again, I, so as, as secular individuals, you know, Christmas... And all the traditions, and, and a lot of the traditions that we that we have and have gotten popular uh, come from uh, pre-Christian sources, right? So the, the idea of the Christmas tree is something that is is pagan uh, in origin from from Northern Europe, um, and see, I knew we shouldn't have put that up. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, all these all these traditions are, are constantly in flux. They're constantly in play. And one of the great triumphs of the Christian Church uh, throughout history is it has been its ability to to um, go into new regions and find these <coughs> existing traditions and existing cultures and integrate with them and you know make their traditions their own 
And you can make this, the very same argument that, you know, we as secular individuals are kind of doing the same thing. We're taking these existing Christian traditions and making them our own, you know? So what's the upside of being a free thinker? What, I mean, I can give you a clear <laughs> two-sentence definition of what the upside is right. being a Christian. What's your upside? What's the benefit? Well, um, stay home Sundays, save 10%. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I can't believe I didn't hear. Amen. I'm, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Actually, um, no. Um, the upside of it is, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that there's an upside per se. You know, I'm not here to, to sell free thought. I'm not. I'm not. I don't really consider myself a, an evangelist for free thought. My, uh, the, the entirety of my effort and my, um, my, my background has been. Um, and even when I was a Christian, it's sort of looking backwards now that I, I realize this, but I was always a person in search of the truth, you know, and, and appreciated the truth. And when I was a Christian, I, was, I loved being a Christian because I thought that being a Christian was the way to the truth. And that's, that's what I loved about it. Um, and I, I don't think I've changed in that respect. I, I think that the the fact that I am a free thinker now, the fact that I've I've since rejected uh, the Bible as a divine document, has been because I've I've always been in search for the truth, and uh, I'm always constantly willing to you know revise that. Um, I'm willing to change my mind. Uh, obviously, I think I've proved that. I've changed at least once. I could change it again. Um, and so that's I mean that's been the thing that's that's driven me. Uh, you know, my entire life is you know searching for the truth. And, you know, as I, I think I've gotten a little bit closer to it as a free thinker, yeah. Um, I could get even closer, you know, from another perspective. I don't know. Um, so I, I, I don't really have, I don't want to recommend free thought absolutely from that respect. I will say that I do feel um, much more uh, comfortable in my own skin um, as a free thinker. I don't quite... As a Christian, there was, there was some level of comfort in the idea that God was always looking out for me and that I never really had to worry too much about what I did um, because even if I screwed up, it was all part of God's plan. And that was kind of comforting. Um, well, I'll go further. It was more than comforting. It was very comforting. Um, but being on my own, I don't know, it's kind of like you know, leaving home for the first time, right? You know, you live with your parents, and, you know, even if you screw up, there's always the idea that, well, you know, but they'll always, you know, take care of me. They'll always, you know, cover me, and, you know, I don't really have to worry too much. Um, and then you go off on your own. And then, you know, then it really is sort of down to you. And it's, it's your decisions that impact the rest of your life. And, um, and you really have to sort of take ownership of yourself, Right? Um, you know, and so as a free thinker, it's, you know, I really am sort of taking ownership of myself. I stand, you know, naked in the cosmos and there is, there is nothing, you know, there's nothing that is, that is directing me. It's just, it's just me and, and everything else that exists. And, you know, and that's, that's kind of inspiring in a way. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's terrifying in a sense, in the same way that going out on your own in, in, for the first time is kind of terrifying. Um, but it's also exhilarating, you know, just to, to stand on a, you know, a, a ball of, a blue ball of rock in the middle of the cosmos and look up at the stars and realize that the atoms in my body have come from stars that exploded billions of years ago. And, and those atoms spread out into the cosmos and then coalesced and formed me, formed you, formed, formed all of us together. And that... To, to think that we're just you know, walking around fully aware, sentient beings made of star dust, basically, you know, is what we are. Um, that is, I mean, to, to me, it's, it kind of takes my breath away, and it's really inspiring. Hey, can, you, can I ask a question? Sure, that's where you lost me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, there was something that you said that I think has been real popular. It was when you started to say that, you know, in, when you were a Christian, you felt like that uh, if you screwed up, it was okay because it was all within God's plan, mm -hmm. and that He was kind of orchestrating everything. Is 
Is that kind of where you lost your way? Is that you felt like more like a, that the church preached things as though you were a puppet? And God orchestrated everything, and that. Uh, or, I mean, because I kind of felt like I, I didn't quite hear. What you're no, I, that. I. I didn't have a problem with it at the time. Right. I mean, I. I, I kind of. I, I liked it. I, I enjoyed it. It was, it was comfortable. It was um, comforting um, at the time. The, the reason, what, what led me out of, of Christianity was not a, a problem that I had with, with anybody personally. It was not a problem that I had with any church you know, as an organization. It was, it was, it was simply the Bible. I, I studied into the Bible, and um, long story short, the, the more I studied in the, the more I came to realize for myself that it, I couldn't accept it anymore as a divine document. I couldn't, I, I, I searched for the face of God and it, it continually got more clouded uh, the further I looked. Yeah, we're going to open it up. So we'll start with Jackson. <laughs> I've got about 10, but I'll only ask that man. Who was Jesus? Who was Jesus? I don't know. I don't know. Um, there's, sort of the presumption um, among most Christians and uh, actually among most atheists that Jesus was a historical person that we can learn about uh, and that we can you know, find more about uh, you know, who he was and what he said and what he taught. Um, and that was actually one of the things that I tried to do um, as I was leaving my faith because as I, as I stepped away from, from you know, Orthodox Christianity, I still... Um, wanted to believe in a God of some sort, even if it wasn't the God that's, that's you know, talked about in the Bible. Um, and I also, primarily because I was raised as a Christian and Jesus was, you know, such an important figure, I wanted to preserve Jesus. I wanted, you know, I wanted to save that. If I could give up the Christianity, and that was fine. Um, but I wanted to save Jesus. And so I, I started studying... Um, uh, a lot of the work that's been done over the past uh, 15, 20 years, studying the historical Jesus. Um, you may have heard of the Jesus Seminar, right? Um, so there's been a, a lot of work, a lot of scholarship that's gone into trying to figure out who Jesus was. And so I, I read books from lots of different scholars who had lots of different takes on it. And it, after a while, I started to realize, you know, pretty much what happens is whenever somebody goes in and tries to explain who Jesus really was, that Jesus ends up sounding a lot like the author every single time. And so then I thought, well, you know, if that's the case, if every single person goes in and finds the Jesus that they're looking for, what, what is the Jesus that actually exists? And so I st started seeing some other scholars and um, historical skeptics that threw a lot of doubt on the idea of Jesus being um, historically verifiable. And I, I would say that for me, I'm... I'm at that point that I'm, I've sort of accepted the hypothesis, not that Jesus didn't live necessarily, but the, the hypothesis that if he did, if he was a historical person, there is so much that has been lost to us and garbled and, and mixed up in what the early church was trying to do and, and preserve about what they thought was important about Jesus, that the, the actual historical core is vanished from our perspective. So it... For me, I'm sort of an agnostic um, where I could go either way. He, maybe he did exist, maybe he didn't. Well, one of the things we learned in studying these 20 religions is 19 of them out of the 20, more or less, all believe in Jesus, mm -hmm. the man. And, the, and, you know, out of that 19, 18 of them said he was a, a good moral man. And mm -hmm. Charlie's blows my mind because how can you, you know, accept his teachings and who he is, yet he claimed to be God, you know? So it's that whole debate. He's either a you know a liar and lunatic, or he's Lord. You can't really take somebody and and take their whole life and their whole work and just omit the whole essence of what he did and why he did it and why he said what he did and put him here. I kind you know? yeah I kind of have a tough time. Well, I understand that. That's the C.S. Lewis dilemma: lunatic, liar, Lord. Um, but I kind of have a problem with the idea of him being this great moral teacher. Um, I think there, there are things that are attributed to him that are, that are great moral truths. I think the golden rule is something that has been um, echoed by lots of different um, people throughout history, Confucius, the Buddha, um, all sorts of different, a lot of Jewish um, rabbis. But uh, one of the things that really bothers me um, is the fact that 
Jesus had an opportunity, at least if you, if you go by the, the gospel, Jesus had an opportunity to, to comment on slavery and to condemn it. And so did Paul. Both had opportunities to comment on slavery and, and condemn them, and neither one did. In fact, you know, Paul you know, cons- you know, used the language of you know, slavery, I'm a slave for Christ, and with Philemon urged him to go back to his master, you know, that had been cruel to him. Jesus um, gave a, uh, a parable about slavery and, and commented on, you know, this is in Luke, I think, 23, where he talks about, you know, the, the slave that is good is beaten only a little bit, but the slave that is bad is beaten a lot. How much, I mean, how much better would it have been for all of human history for if, if he had just simply said, you know, slavery is a bad thing, do not do it. You know, how much, how much suffering and how much evil could have been prevented <coughs> If that had been, you know, and I don't mean to second guess Jesus, you know. Well, he said don't kill people, and people still kill people for it. So that, just because he said it doesn't make people do it. Well, that, I mean, but, but I think it would have had some sort of an impact. If you could clearly show, because one of the problems within this country, you know, during the Civil War is that you had pastors in the North arguing against slavery, and you had pastors in the South arguing There's for slavery. There's a totally different type of slavery whatsoever. You are indebted to people because of a monetary value, not people that were taking from another country and brought over here that did not owe us anything. That is, that, that is not even the same thing. So I guess what my, my question is to you, you getting together with people all over the world, what is the point, what is the goodness, and where does your goodness come from? Because obviously you hold a lot of value on man since there is no God. Where is your man that is helping our nation? What things are you doing differently to help our children be different and our world be different? Because obviously if there's not God to save us and we only have man to save us, mm-hmm. what are you guys doing? Well, so my organization, the Fellowship of Free Thought, uh, one of our core components, one of our core missions, is actually charitable outreach. So we do a lot um, in the community. We, you know, we collect food for the homeless. We collect, you know, clothes for people. Um, the last thing we did was collect um, a lot of books for. There's a there's a children's school that uh, they didn't have enough books, and so we collect a lot of books for them. Um, and we're also uh, so we do that all the time. And we're also partnered with a, um, a a national organization, or international organization, I should say, called the Foundation Beyond Belief. And the Foundation Beyond Belief it was formed to be this uh, sort of umbrella uh, charitable organization that gives people, um, secular people, atheists, free thinkers, or whatever, an, an opportunity to, um, to to plug in and to, and to help, you know, help in, enforce you know some good in, in different places throughout the world. And you know the charities that are supported by the foundation, you know, do they're they're sort of specifically chosen because they're not. Evangelical, you know, they don't they don't go out and, and you know pass out Bibles and things like that. Um, they do they do good sort of for goodness sake, like um, Doctors Without Borders. Have you ever heard of them? Medicine and yeah. yeah. and they they do great work. And they're just a, a secular organization. They're not affiliated with any religion. So that's the type of thing that we want to see more of. We want to see you know this happening. And so the Foundation Beyond Belief, you know, reaches out to those groups and supports them. And um, the fact that they exist and the fact that our group, you know, partners with them and we hold, uh, every month we hold a, a mini benefit, you know, to raise money for that so that we're all sort of cooperating, we're all, you know, coordinating as a group. And that's, that's actually something that is um, uh, deficient in, in a significant way amongst uh, atheists and free thinkers is this um, sort of coordinated um, charitable outreach opportunity. Because you know, one of the things that churches do fantastically well is is coordinate those types of of, of you know organizations, and they do a fantastic job of of mobilizing people, collecting donations, and affecting good in different places in the world. That has been fantastic. I don't think that only churches can do that. I don't think that only people who are motivated by you know a love of, of Christ or you know whatever in their lives can do that. And you know we we're seeing lots of these organizations come up and. Um, you know, people. It, it, I think it's primarily a sociological phenomenon because these the atheists and agnostics are not plugged into churches. They're, they're not parts of organizations like this that they can easily, you know, donate money or volunteer or go on, you know, a service trip or something like that. But that is coming. Jamie, so did you have a question? Yes. 
all Christians. Um, it says we are all Christians have received Christ, and part of receiving Christ is that we believe in eternal life. Mm -hmm. And so, I guess my question to you is, what happens when you die? It becomes like a compost pile, or like a you know, piece of dirt. My second question to you is, as you grew up as a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, as a Christian in your younger life, received Christ, your name was etched in the Lamb of God's heart. Mm -hmm. So. Do you realize that maybe if you die, you're probably, we're probably still going to see you up there? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, so when I die, you know, what I, you know, what, what all of us know is that you know, our, our bodies decompose. And um, the, the atoms that, that made me up, you know, will disperse and, you know, go back into the cosmos from whence they came. Um, what happens to me, you know, the, the, the me that is talking to me, that is thinking, the, the, you know, the me that, you know, you, you typically think of your soul, your spirit, right? What is that? I don't know. I don't know what happens to that. Um, I suspect that it will be very similar to what I experienced before I was born. Um, now, as to your question um, about, you know, me being a Christian, yes, I, I, I did accept and I was baptized and, you know, did the whole thing. And it may very well be possible that I am still saved. Um, there have been many Christians that have told me that. I don't really have a problem with that. Um, I mean, I saw that. So you believe that you're an eternal spirit? Is that what you're saying? No, I, I, no, spirit is eternal. I don't. No. I mean, I don't believe that. It may be true that that's the case. And uh, if, if, if I do die and I, I do end up in heaven, it's, it, it won't disappoint me, I don't think. Um, How could it not? But, so, <laughs> I mean, your whole life went through this funny microcosm, your moon dust, and then all of a sudden you're going, oh, holy crap. Man, I was wrong. How could you not? But, it, but, it's, but if, you truly saved, you you could, if you were truly saved, you couldn't turn away and say that God didn't exist. But on top of that, I mean, how do you explain some people say that, microorganisms, yeah. all the different species of life, how complex the body and everything else is in the ecosystem? I mean, is that just all magic? Just us? No, it's not. It's not magic. No, it's not magic. Accidental. Can y'all's conversation. Can we get back to cosmic dust? Jason. Jason, raise your hand if you have a question. I mean, I I to be honest, it sounds like it'd be sitting over here talking back and forth. I'd love to go sit at the flying saucer and have some philosophical conversation with you. I mean, because it sounds to me like the biggest thing is there's what's happening here on Earth and there's the eternal. How much conversation is there about the afterlife? Because you're absolutely right. We're here to do some good and charitable stuff, and you guys, and that's, and that's how it, we'll take from the homeless perspective, spring it to us, we don't mind at all. But, but from an eternal standpoint, how much conversation, because Kant says, hey, there's things that we don't know. Yep. You know, Kant said, his, his rationale came to the point that there are things beyond my existence that I'll never know. Yep, and, and that's very true. The, the, the problem is that when we discuss things, um, like I was saying before about being a free thinker, uh, having, having, you know, rational... Uh, critical thinking, and, but also bringing evidence. And as regards to the afterlife, there's, there's, I mean, the only evidence that anybody could really bring are, you know, people who've gone into comas and then they come back and they tell stories. And it's just, and the problem with that is it's just stories. You know, I mean, they're they're interesting stories. They may be accurate. I don't know, but it's it's really hard to um, to make any sense of of you know these stories, and especially when you look into the brain and the way the brain works and. You know, but in evidence, we, and you said second, I don't know if it was, if you gave the right number of years, you said over the past 50 to 20 years of having people mm -hmm. you know, have experienced that, the evidence to me would be, I've got a book that is of that time that has been researched, and yeah, there's a lot of books that weren't included in that book, but that's that's evidence of the time. If I want to learn about George Washington, I could have John Adams tell me about it, I'm going to have John Adams and Bill Clinton, because John Adams mm -hmm. was there. And so you've got evidence that's historically documented that was from that time. Mm -hmm as opposed to people that are 10 to 15 years have done their own research in that. So, I mean, that, I'd be interested, I guess, to know where your thoughts are. The, the historical validity of the Bible, you mean? Yes. I mean, it's tough, right? So you brought up George Washington, right? So you're familiar with, you know, how when he was a child, he chopped down the cherry tree, and he, you know, his father caught him, and he said, I cannot tell a lie, I chopped down the cherry tree, right? Everybody knows that story. Didn't happen, right? Right. Yeah. But it was written in the autobiography or the biography of George Washington by Washington Irving, which was the definitive um, work on Washington's life. And he, Washington Irving, included that as as if it were history, as if it really was something that happened to the young George Washington. And my interpretation of of the Gospels is that it's it's kind of like that, right? So 
Washington Irving include that story about George Washington as a child to make a point. He wanted to he wanted to get across the idea that George Washington was a upstanding, honest, noble person and had been since he was born, right? And so, in order to, to get that point across, he includes the story about the cherry tree. And um, you know, the Gospels were written. There's lots of arguments, but you know, years after the event, by people who had a vested interest, by by early Christians who wanted this belief to be you know propagated, and so they had a vested interest in in presenting Jesus as as a positive figure and and making certain theological points. And so it's it's very hard to me for me to differentiate, and it's hard for other scholars too, um, to, to differentiate what are what are the the, the stories that are told in there about Jesus that actually happened versus those stories that are told simply to make a theological point right. about who he was. And that's so you, Jay, go ahead. Um, do you mind if I ask you some personal questions? Sure, absolutely. Okay, I'd like to know your educational background and is this a living for you? Like, do you make a living being part of this group that, uh, now that you're becoming the leader of that or do you do something else? And I would like to know what denominational standpoint you came from in Christianity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those are my questions. So um, I studied biology as an undergraduate. I'm and just curious where. At University of Cincinnati. Oh, I studied biology. Don't course. send your kids there. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's, it's funny. Um, this is just as an aside. The, the course that I took, the course on the Bible that I took at University of Cincinnati mm-hmm was the exact same course taught by the exact same professor that my father took when he was in school. So when my father was in school, um, the professor was very young, obviously. I was, he was much older. He was about to retire when I had him. But it was the exact same professor, um, exact same course. In fact, I compared notes with my father. He kept some of his old notes, and they were the exact same notes. So I took that class, and that sent me in a trajectory away from Christianity. My father took that class, and he's still a Christian to this day. So, I mean, it's... It's not just the education. I, you know, I think there are a lot of things yeah. about me that, that you know, affected that. But So I studied biology, and then I went and did a, a doctoral program uh, in uh, molecular biology, basically, uh, also at University of Cincinnati. The denomination that I came from was primarily Reformed Baptist, uh, so very, very heavily Calvinist, mm-hmm. and, it's, and so the, the preservation of the saints, obviously. Um, and I do not make a living at this. Um, actually, none of us make a living. All the organizations uh, in the Dust Forward Coalition of Reason, um, they're all run by volunteers. Um, so it's it's purely a labor of love, something that we really enjoy doing. Go ahead. I'll come back to you. Thanks. Virginia. Um, I just, this is almost more for the class. There's that. Um, but I wanted to go back to something he said in the middle but, but about kids. Because he asked us, a lot of us have kids. I have a two-year-old. And I'm working on her obedience right now. And just read a book yesterday, part of it, that Evan's been urging me to. And he gave an example about if you have two kids, one has a toy, one has another. And one kid takes it from the other, Polly. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and the, the parent was saying, well, how would you feel if Polly took the toy from you? That's, that's not how we should be, what we should be saying to our kids. We should be saying to our kids, I said, don't take toys from Polly. She's taking it from them, and you do it because I said so. And so I just wanted to say that to you. It's a good teaching point as a parent about how we as parents are parenting our kids. I don't know if you, any of you came on Sunday. The speakers talked a lot about our kids, and we're going to grow up a generation of kids who don't believe in God. And it's about where it starts at home when they're young, when they're little, when they can crawl. And I think it's, I mean, this is what I'm dealing with personally. And for you to say that example, it really speaks to me because that's not, I mean, they're not going to believe in God if we tell them, that, how do you feel about this? You've got to give them an example of who God is in your life and obedience for them to be able to understand as they grow up. I would, I would caution you um, about that just a little bit. Well, I know you would. No, 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 no. no, no, no. But, but also um, to, your, to your benefit, because um, when, you, when you parent in that way, and I'm, I'm not a parent myself, so I, I'm not speaking as an authority, but, when you, but as a child, I have some memory of these things. Um, when you parent in that way, you're setting yourself up as the authority, right? right cause you, you, because you are, right. And, and if you reinforce that... Uh, and this is just my sense. If you reinforce that, 
um, that the morality, the, the right or wrong, comes from because you said so, then ultimately, as, as kids, you know, they will reject your authority. It's inevitable when they become teenagers, when they become adults, they will reject your authority. So I would urge you to be cautious in tying that to you know, a belief in God because it's easy for them to reject God at the same time they reject your authority. Not every child. All right, Scott. Well, no, 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 I, I, I want to say something to what he's saying because he's making a very good point. And anytime, whether it be in a managerial situation or any kind of uh, counseling down at the homeless, anytime you have an overfunctioner, you give someone an opportunity to underfunction. You cannot take responsibility for someone's salvation. So we are to guide our children in our beliefs. But at the end of the day, when we overfunction, as Zach's talking about, we do often run our kids <clears throat> too far in the other direction. That's why a lot of pastors' kids are where they are. And um, it's a very common, well-known fact that overfunctioning can often lead to, well, underfunctioning by the kids. All right, Scott, and then Nick, and then I'll close this. I think there's a lot of things that you can question in history and you can go back and forth. I don't mm -hmm. think that means you know any more than I do about it. But my question is about the future. Why would you promote and take a... a leadership position and do you think that that society without faith and without God is any better? Do you think holding yourself accountable is better than having someone to look to? I don't know. I don't know if it's better. I mean, that's, that's, that's a good question. I don't know if it's better. Um, and it, it, you know, there's, there's a lot that religion has going for it. I mean, it does a lot of social good in the world. Um, my problem is, you know, whether or not it's true. You know, so whether or not religion does, and there are people, there are atheists that make the argument that, well, of course it's not true, but we should encourage everybody to be religious anyway, because it does such a good thing for society, right? And, you know, I, I don't really feel good about that, because, again, like I was saying, for me, it's always been, you know, the pursuit of truth. I'm, I'm, I'm mostly concerned with, you know, learning as much as I can about reality and, and finding things out that are true. And so, even if adopting a belief that happens to be false, you know, makes you a better person. I mean, maybe makes society, as a whole. Maybe make society better as a whole, but still it's a false belief. And I, uh, you know, it's kind of like teaching your kids about Santa Claus, right? You might teach them about Santa Claus and say, well, look, if you're good, the Santa Claus will bring you presents. And it might make a change in their behavior, but it's still kind of, you're lying to your kids at that point, you know? And I, I'm not comfortable with that. Personally. Right. Nick, and then I'll close this. All right, so we discussed what the upside was. You get to keep Sundays off. Ten <laughs> percent. Actually, I, I don't. Well, I do. We do meet on Sundays, and we do donate. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the downside. You know, I look at it and I go, I'd rather live my life and be wrong than live your life and be right. And that's not a judgment. That's just I can't imagine having that sort of faith in myself. God says we'll all know just by what we see in the creation around us, in our kids, and everything else. To kind of chalk up being a good person to yourself is really kind of what it comes down to. Because you have no higher belief in something else. So at that point, we're left to be humans. Mm -hmm. At the core, we're terrible as humans. We're, we're rapists, we're thieves, we're liars, we're adulterers. So why in the world would you want to be a human? I, I guess at the end of the day, um, the idea that we are fallen angels has less appeal to me than the idea that we can be, you know, raised apes. I, I think that, that having that, that low view of humanity um, allows us to, you know, and not to say that, that whatever we can do is going to, you know, solve all of our problems, but I like to think that we can improve ourselves. And so, you know, having, having that human focus, I mean, from, from, you know, the only, in the Christian perspective, the only way we can improve, really, is to go to heaven, right? If you say, you go through all those steps of salvation, we're, we're, and, good, we're good here. But, but the only way to be perfect is to be in heaven, right? And so, for me, I, I, I like to think that we can not achieve perfection, but I think we can, you know, go in a positive direction here. I, I'd like to see, you know, that... You can, but society can. Why would prove? What's your purpose? Maybe put God out of it and look at, at history over time. We've, we've we've proven that we can't. We can't.
we strive for it, and certain people do, but then there's certain people that take over and, and prove that they can. You know, over time, Romans and I mean all. What if you're history. wrong? If I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. I've been wrong before. Hey, what do you have to lose? <coughs> oh, what, right. I gotta close this. Y'all are more than welcome to come up front, talk. He said he'll stay long and answer any questions. Let me close this. Emily, Father, I just come before you and just an awe. Of you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the ability to uh, just hear from Zachary and discuss uh, where this is coming from and this mindset. And Father, that you would give us love for. Uh, the atheists and the free thinkers, that they would see Christ in us in such a way that it would draw them. And Father, I pray and just come in agreement with everybody in this room that you would give Zachary a road to Damascus type experience, that he would have definitive uh, answers to his questions because he is an influencer uh, in his group, Father. And I just pray that uh, you do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. All right. Appreciate thank you very much. Hey, thank you for your time to come uh, spend it with us. Thank you.